Schmidt. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Paul Jensen. I practice down in Pleasant Grove. Uh, my degree is in chiropractic. I, I do a lot of chiropractic work, um, and then I do a lot of other nutritional type therapy, homeopathy, uh, just kind of a wide variety of uh, modalities. So how many of you have ever heard of the term morbidity compression? Okay. So, so the idea behind uh, this term is uh, Amer Americans typically by about age 40 start to have d disease processes occurring in their, in their health. And little by little, if this, if this is good health down below here, every decade, uh, most Americans will continue to, to move toward ill health. And so by the time they, they get in that last decade of their lives, 70, 80, sometimes 60, they have a lot, they have a lot of ill health. And of course, this, this has a lot of uh, impact on their quality of life but it also has a lot of economic impact. You know, it's expensive to be unhealthy. And uh, it, it, uh, it can impact you in a lot of different ways. And so, so the idea behind morbidity compression is <coughs> rather than following this typical American paradigm, which is everybody, everybody assumes is gonna happen as they age, <coughs> we try to compress all of our disease processes into that very last part of our life by living a more healthy lifestyle. Um, and so the goal would be to, to live to whatever age you would like, hopefully somewhere around 90 to 100, 100 years old with, with the same health that you had when you were in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, maybe a little bit slower, but <coughs> basically the same health that you had and then you just drop dead and you're, you're gone. So, so that's what I try to promote with patients and, and try to get them to see that vision that if they will live a healthier lifestyle, uh, they can really compress their diseases into a, um, a shorter span in their life. So there's two theories of aging. Um, and the first theory is what, what most patients get when they go to a doctor and the doctor tells them that they have this disease process and the patient asks them why and they'll, they'll, they'll either get the answer, well, you're just getting older or you have bad genes, okay? Uh, and so unless you have really good genes like this lady, uh, most of us have to behave and uh, embrace more of, uh, more of this theory, which is the older you get, the more you pay for your uh, misbehavior when you were younger. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so again, we, we want to try to empower our patients to uh, understand this concept that genetics is not necessarily the, the you know, having bad genes is not necessarily the end of, the, end of everything. And, and actually the studies show that there's only about a 25% variance in longevity with your genetics. The other 75% uh, has everything to do with your environment and health habits. And particularly if you know your, your family's health history and you do have a history of certain things that occur in your family, you can actually even reduce that 25% even lower by, by taking appropriate steps for different uh, disease processes. So, Top causes of morbidity. Who would um, who would uh, take a guess on what would be the top cause? We're Americans. <laughs> well, Americans. We die of heart attacks. Yeah. So vascular is number one. Any other ideas? Kidney failure. Pardon? Kidney failure, diabetic. Kidney failure is in, in the top causes. Uh, cancer. Is the but the next cause is cancer. Uh -huh. So vascular disease. Um, can be anywhere from, depending on what statistics you look at, 30 to 50 percent. Um, cancer is about 25 percent now, as opposed to a century ago, cancer was about 4 percent. And, uh, and now what the statistics are showing is about one in two people will end up with cancer. They all won't die from it, about 75 percent will, but uh, 
it's, it's, it's a huge problem nowadays. So uh, this was mentioned, uh, uh, what's called metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is kind of a new category. Not that, that it's a new disease, it's been around, but when I was in school 30, 35 years ago, that this term didn't exist, even though there was people that had metabolic syndrome. Probably around, in the 70s, it was probably around 10 to 15 percent of the population had metabolic syndrome. Now it's somewhere in the 50, 60 percent range. So it's really gone up exponentially every, every decade. There's five things that, are, that, uh, are, that class you as having metabolic syndrome. One is abdominal obesity, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, high triglycerides. Notice it's not high triglycerides, it's high triglycerides, not high cholesterol, and then low HDL levels. Okay, and then the, the one that everybody is the most terrified of is the cognitive issues, Alzheimer's and dementia which is a, becoming a bigger and bigger problem. And then we get the lung, and then we get the kidney, and then the last <clears throat> category would be autoimmune, which is your arthritis and lupus, and, and a lot of the other degenerative diseases have autoimmune components, even Alzheimer's, uh, they've shown in a lot of studies now, is, is related to autoimmune issues. Quick question. Okay. Years ago, in the top five were also iatrogenic diseases. And <coughs> infections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that still in our top ten? Or it still is. The medical yeah. system actually yeah. better. And again, it's a lot. It depends on where you look on the internet. But no, iatrogenic disease is actually. If you look at certain statistics and certain things, it is actually number one, the number one cause of death. And we're more talking about morbidity, right. uh, but really there's a lot of crossover, yeah. you know, because vascular disease, if you're talking about mortality, is actually 50%, 50% die of vascular disease. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so, so how do you screen for morbidity risk? Uh, obviously, the the first thing you, we want to do is listen to our patients, uh, listen to their symptoms, and um, pay attention to those symptoms. Uh, for, an exa for example, uh, the cognitive issues we were talking about with Alzheimer's and um, dementia. If somebody complains of, of having brain fog or some type of cognitive problem younger in life, uh, the research shows that they, they are much more apt to, to get Alzheimer's later, later in life. And so if we can pay attention to that, we, we can do things to try to reduce that brain inflammation and, and maybe save these people from, from some um, major disease down, down the road. Digestive distress would be another one, gallbladder. Gallbladders are uh, the number one surgery in the U.S. and uh, if people start complaining of digestive distress, uh, a good majority of those will have gallbladder issues and, and there's things you can do to reverse that disease process before they have to have it removed. So lifestyle, um, there's really five things that we, we focus on, uh, eating, drinking, exercise, sleeping, and stress management. When we talk about drinking, that's keeping yourself hydrated, but it's also, um, <coughs> what you're drinking as far as in the way of alcohol. You know, alcohol, there's more and more studies show that even a small glass of wine on a daily basis it impacts your health quite, quite dramatically now. And so um, the more you look into the alcohol thing, the, the more uh, you need to really curtail that, that alcohol habit. Even, even a glass of wine with, with dinner is not good. So, on just recapping back on lifestyle, um, what of those five things, which one do you think is research-wise has the biggest impact on people's health? Any ideas? Stress. CRP or thyroid. Moving moving back to lifestyle, eating, drinking, 
exercise, sleeping, and stress management. Which one of those do you think would, would have the biggest impact according to the latest research? Eating. Exercise. Sleep, sleep, sleep. Eating. Sleep. <laughs> yes. Sleep is number one. So. I'm not even a doctor. Yeah, so, <laughs> so if, you're, if, if your patients aren't sleeping, there's no point in, in uh, going any further until you focus on that issue. You've got to get patients to sleep or they won't heal and, and they will get disease from, from sleep. Okay, so we do, we do a lot of blood work um, and you can, you can get a lot from blood work if you test enough things. The problem is most of the medical profession are now doing a, a comprehensive metabolic panel a CBC and a TSH, and that's it. And they they miss all the all the thyroid issues with the TSH. We find we find lots and lots of Hashimoto's issue. We find lots of uh, people that have low iron stores and and consequently can be in uh, borderline anemic and those kind of things. How many of you have had your uh, C-reactive protein tested, CRP? So. What they show in the research is the higher your C-reactive protein, the shorter your life. So, so that's a real important one to, to know where, you, where you're at and work on that. And then we, we see a lot of, of course, metabolic syndrome issues where there's a high A1C. And, and the other one that we've started doing in the last couple of years is, is insulin because insulin is actually a better indicator of where you're at in that that line of, of metabolic issues. And so our goal with patients is to actually get them lab low with their insulin levels because lab ranges are based on uh, normal, you know, normal Americans. And that, that can make a huge difference in, in longevity and uh, health. So the other, the other big one that um, I spend a lot of time on is people's drug habits. And a lot of these are over-the-counter drug, drug habits. Um, and there's, um, there's lots and lots of research coming out about the problem with some of these drugs. Uh, and one of the things that I do when I see uh, that patients are on a certain um, medication is I have handouts and so rather than having magazines in my front reception area I have these these little clear folders that have papers in that I've written about different drug reactions different different problems and I make them read that instead of drug advertisements in the magazines so, <laughs> so um, anybody uh, read the research on uh, the the hypnotic issue, which is sleeping pills. So there, there, there was a research study, a big research study back in um, 2012, and it was, um, this, the number of people in the study was 10,500, and those who took hypnotics uh, over 18, hypnotics, which is not too, much, too many in a year, had four times uh, a greater risk of death during that 2.5 year study. And if you were over um, 132, that went up to five times the risk of death over a period of only three years, actually less than three years, two and a half years. You mm -hmm. had five times risk of death. You're talking about like Ambien and that class? Yes. And what mm -hmm. were they dying of? All cause, all cause all mortality. Cause <laughs> Driving, not knowing their yeah. I mean, I mean that that was oh, in those ten thousand people, five times greater. That's five hundred percent increased risk of, of death just from taking hypnotics. And the other thing they discovered was about thirty five percent of them had an increased risk of cancer. Some of those died from cancer, but others just contracted cancer. Thirty five percent more than the typical. Uh, person taking, not taking hypnotics. No, the question was, my question would be is, is it uh, because they're not sleeping or is it because they're taking the drug? Because they're taking the drug. And see, one of the things that people don't understand about hypnotics is hypnotics only make you drowsy. They don't actually get in, you into an REM sleep. So you don't, actually don't sleep well on a hypnotic. 
And so that's part of the problem. So it comes back to that risk of not sleeping. When you're taking hypnotic, you're still not sleeping good. So is not sleeping good better than not sleeping? <laughs> I mean, I just, I have a serious sleep issue. Yeah. So I'm really curious because... So, so what we try to do is, is we try to find alternatives to hypnotics as far as fixing, fixing the sleep, sleep issues. And there's lots of things out there that work for sleep. They're safe. So, does melatonin count as a like? Is it considered a hypnotic? No, melatonin is is definitely something that you can use um, for uh, sleep that, that's safe. I don't know that I'd recommend giving it to kids because there's never been any studies on it with right. kids. But but uh, one of the reasons that a lot of people are on hypnotics is they're on antidepressants, and antidepressants decrease your serotonin breakdown, which you need to produce melatonin. And so, so first they get on an antidepressant and then they have to get on a hypnotic in order to sleep because their sleep goes away on an antidepressant, so. And doesn't that cost also really increase the risk of dementia? Yes, yeah, all kinds of risks. So, so I, have, I have little papers and I'll pass these around. If you, if you want to take one, uh, feel free. And if you want to pass them out to people, you know, make copies and pass them out, you're, feel free, they're not, they're not copyrighted. Um, so that's one of the things I really focus a lot on is trying to educate people about the dangers of some of these drugs. Statins is in there and um, I really don't miss worse too much about statins as far as um, what a scam that is. Is you know. that the blood, a blood pressure one? Statin is to lower your cholesterol. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So. You know what, doctor? What about, you know what my big concern is? With kids in college and such as um, Adderall. What's yeah. that? I'm sorry that I don't know, but what's well, Adderall, that? Adderall is meth. It's it's prescription meth essentially. <laughs> so what it does is it whips your adrenals on a regular basis, and it, it can really have it have a big impact on your adrenals. But there's also a lot of other side effects to Adderall, um, and it's also addictive. So it's very hard to get off of once you once you take it. I just read an article about the um, Adderall in breast milk yeah. to babies, and it decreases their frontal lobe. Yeah, their and, that, executive and that's the that's system. the other issue is is these drugs they they get everywhere. They get in even get in our water supply now, uh, and mm -hmm. you can't you can't filter them out. It's it's a big problem, and that's, so. Yeah. So the other, thing, the other thing I do to screen is I do Chinese Meridian Assessment, uh, which a lot of you are familiar with, uh, or it's called electrodermal screening. Those, uh, there's, there's a lot of different devices out there um, that have been around since the 50s. And, and it's, a good, it's a good tool to, to help people, uh, to help, help me understand what's going on with people. And then the, the last thing I do uh, a lot is I do the heart sound recorder or any I know Cindy has one are any of you familiar with the heart sound recorder oh, yeah. okay is it the same as the endocardiograph the it's endocardiograph? basically the new version of the endocardiograph I brought mine if anybody wants to have their heart tested we can do that after it takes about about 15 minutes so it's pretty pretty what simple to do? do pardon what is it for <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that at the end okay, okay. all right so Nutrients most affecting our morbidity. So th this is, the list I have is a, kind of a basic list, but before we start with my list, I wanted to throw out a question to all of you. If you could only take one supplement, what would it be? And I'm not saying that, I, that my supplement's better than yours, but I'm just curious. What? CoQ10. CoQ10, okay. Fish oil. Trace Good. minerals. Trace mineral. Good. So, any other? Given that I'm eating okay, I'd be liposome and vitamin C. Okay. All right. Because I have people coughing in my face all day long. Yeah. <laughs> so those are all those are all good answers. So um, my list starts with uh, calcium, magnesium, which might surprise some of you. Um, and then the next two is vitamin D and vitamin K2. Are, are you familiar with K2 or um, what I use is standard process Cataplex F. Um, so the reason I put those three up together is because 
these are very synergistic. Without uh, vitamin D and vitamin K2, you can't utilize your calcium in your body. But calcium um, has a, a wide range. We all think of calcium for, for helping our bones, but it's one of the key ways to keep your immune system healthy. Your immune system uses calcium to fight any bug. Uh, it actually, they've, sh they've shown studies where it actually throws a calcium cloud over the, over the organism to help kill it. So that's, that's real important. It's very important for skin health and it's very important for muscle health. Now, muscle health won't kill you except for what? Your heart is. Your heart is a muscle. And so you, you need your heart to beat all the time and calcium and magnesium are real, real critical for heart health. Okay, so the next one would be vitamin A and notice that I put non-synthetic vitamin A which is a big problem. We're going to talk a little bit about that. The whole vitamin C complex, I have my favorite, and we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. And then the last two are iodine and zinc. Now, iodine is um, somewhat of a controversial subject, and one of the reasons is certain people do react to iodine. Uh, one of the main reasons they react to iodine is they need it. And uh, when, they, when they get it, they, their body will actually start to detox when, when they ingest it. And then anybody that has a thyroid autoimmune disease shouldn't take iodine because it, it will, will make that worse. But there's been a lot of studies on iodine. The best book is uh, Brownstein's book. It's called Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. And he, he spent years testing people for, for iodine deficiencies with a urine, urine excretion test. And his conclusion was to don't bother with the test, just give everybody iodine because everybody's deficient. That was his experience with it. Uh, Japanese um, women consume 100 times more iodine than American women. They have no breast disease and they have no heart disease. So those, so those are the two big things you can prevent with iodine, but iodine is also very, very good for your thyroid, thyroid hormone production, and it's also really good to prevent infection because it's an antiseptic. So, so it's one of the ways you can help with infections. And then zinc, and we're going to talk a little bit more about zinc too. Okay, so getting back to the synthetic A thing. Um, I want to take the time to go over all these um, symptoms of, uh, that people have, have had from taking synthetic A, but there's a lot. And it can be very toxic. Uh, the very worst part of, of doing synthetic A is it can, uh, can be toxic to your liver and it can cause birth defects. But I just wanted to point out this label here. This is a, this is a, and by the way, if I was, could only take one thing, it would be cod liver oil, good cod liver oil, uh, not the kind like it is on this label. So this is a, a cod liver oil label, and if you look on that, it says vitamin A as vitamin A palmitate and vitamin D as coleus calciferol, which means what they've done is because, because a lot of cod liver oil is full of contaminants, is they process that to get the contaminants out, which also takes out the A and the D, the natural A and the D, and then they have to add it back synthetically. So any of you taking cod liver oil, make sure you read your labels and make sure you, you get the real thing. Okay, so low vitamin D, um, there's been a lot of research done on, on D since about er the early 2000s. Vitamin D is a good blood test to, to do on, on people and it's a good blood test to have to make sure that you are in that, that sweet range uh, that you should be. You don't want to be too high in vitamin E either. Uh, you want to be between about 30 and 40. But we test a lot of patients that are in the, in the 15, sometimes 20, 20 range. It's pr pretty common. Uh, and again, what, what is happening in, in, the, in the medical circles is, is a, lot, a lot of doctors are starting to test for vitamin D, but then they put them on a high dose synthetic, which I think really ultimately doesn't work. So, 
The best source of vitamin D is what? Sunshine. So, so if you get out in the sunshine and you're eating enough cholesterol, so you have the precursor to vitamin D, that's the best way to get your vitamin D. Have you seen the studies on sun in eye versus skin? No. Indirect sunlight to the eye is like n multiple times more effective than skin. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So sunglasses. Yeah. yeah. Get ready for sunglasses. Ah, yeah. oh, come on. But then you get cataract. <laughs> But you can prevent cataracts with better nutrition. Yeah. So, because cataracts is a nutritional issue. Okay. So, uh, and then zinc. Zinc has lots and lots of issues associated with low zinc. And a lot of your um, multiple vitamins now do contain zinc because of the studies that have been done on <coughs> zinc. Um, but what I find, uh, has anybody heard of the zinc taste test? Uh, what, what I find when I test patients, even though they say they're on zinc, is a lot of them are still low on zinc. Uh, and the zinc taste test is a really simple thing. I actually have some here. If anybody wants to do that after, we can, we can test them. But essentially, you hold a tablespoon of zinc solution in your mouth for about 30 seconds. And, uh, and then you look for these, these results. Um, if you can't taste it, you're really highly deficient. And the reason being is if your body needs zinc, your, your mouth will just absorb that right in almost immediately. So if you're, if you're in good shape with zinc, uh, I see a lot of people that are borderline deficient. They can taste a little bit, but they don't, they don't taste too much. But if you, if you really are, um, sufficient in zinc, the, that solution tastes terrible. So, Okay, so moving right along, and, and this is kind of how I'm going to end my uh, discussion is, is talking about uh, a product called Cyruta Plus. Have any of you familiar with that? Okay, so Cyruta Plus is, is, um, is basically uh, buckleaf juice, buckleaf uh, seed and juice um, and basically what it is is that whole vitamin C complex that we were talking about, that I mentioned back there just briefly so um, so why do you need a whole vitamin C complex the number one reason is to, to keep your collagen strong okay and we have about 24 different types of collagen in our body all need vitamin C to make strong collagen. So the typical symptoms of weak collagen, bruise easy, I'm, sh I'm sure you know lots of people that, <clears throat> that bruise. You can, put, you can put these patients on uh, Cyruta Plus for about four to six months and they'll, all their bruising will go away. Uh, little kids with nosebleeds, frequent nosebleeds, you can fix that with Cyruta Plus. Loose teeth, loose joints, uh, how many know somebody who's, who's tore a tendon just, just um, randomly? I had a patient uh, a couple of weeks ago, they were walking down the beach and a wave came in and she kind of ran to get, get away from the wave and she tore her hamstring tendon right off. And that is not normal. That's a collagen problem. So, I mean, obviously athletes do that once in a while, but uh, that is definitely a weak collagen issue, and that's miserable. That is a miserable thing. So you can prevent a lot of that with, with uh, the whole food vitamin C complex. Varicose veins is, a, is another weak collagen issue, spider veins. Hemorrhoids are basically a varicose vein as well. And then wrinkling also can be slowed down with uh, the vitamin C complex. Okay, so, um, so these, are, these are the typical symptoms of weak collagen, but the, the main reason that you want strong collagen is for vascular health. We talked about the fact that um, the number one killer of um, Americans is vascular disease. So your vessel, all your vessels uh, depend on collagen for flexibility. So when your heart pumps, that vessel expands, particularly your arteries. It, 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 expand, it expands with that extra pressure from your heart. 
So if you have um, weak collagen, you have the potential to create micro tears in that, in that vessel. And when you get micro tears, <clears throat> the best case scenario is your body will patch those. And it patches it with a plaque. We're all familiar with plaque. We hear about that on television all the time, caused by cholesterol issues. Okay, but blaming plaques, cholesterol on plaques, is like blaming firemen for fires, <laughs> because the cholesterol is actually what the body uses to 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 repair that damage when you have weak collagen. So atherosclerosis is really not caused by cholesterol, it's caused by weak collagen. So, one of the reasons. So that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario is when you have the blood vessel gets damaged enough that it tears to where those collagen fibers become exposed to the blood. And when that happens, the platelets will will start secreting a chemical that makes them sticky. And then the platelets stick together, creating a kind of a mesh, a fiber mesh, which catches blood cells, which creates a clot. And, um, and that, that's great when you have a cut. I mean, that's what the system's designed to do, is keep you from bleeding to death. When you have a, when, when the body senses that there is bleeding, but if you just have weak blood vessels and uh, that occurs, then you've got a clot in a blood vessel that can break loose, go to your heart, go to your brain and kill you. So, so what the, there's been a lot of research done on blood clots because it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. Um, and um, one of the research papers I read, the, the researcher made this statement, which I thought was pretty impressive. It's, he says, it's not always fully appreciated that half of Americans die as a result of a blood clot in either their heart or their brain. One half of Americans die from that. And so uh, they, they've done a lot of research on the best way to prevent clots. They studied over 5,000 compounds. Uh, the number the best compound was rutin, okay? Uh, the, the official name is quercetin 3 rutinicide but rutin for short. And rutin is one of the main ingredients in Cyberdu Plus, so. And so finally, um, so Cyberdu Plus has a lot of other benefits as well. Like I say, it prevents the formation of blood clots. In their research, the reason they, they concluded that was that it inhibits a particular enzyme that causes clotting. Um, but I think really it's probably even more important that uh, the reason the rutin is helping is it's making your collagen stronger and preventing those tears, which is actually the, the main thing that's causing the blood clot. So rutin is also uh, really good for uh, preventing protein degeneration and bone degeneration. So we, we don't think of bone as, um, as a collagen substance, but the inside of bone is a protein matrix full of collagen. And so without good quality col collagen, you're, you're gonna get osteoporosis and you're also gonna get arthritis because that, you need that, that protein matrix viable for the blood to circulate into that bone and provide nutrients, particularly to the articular surface. So what the research is showing that is a lot of a lot of osteoarthritis is is a actual circulatory problem coming from from the, the circulation the damage of the inside of that bone and the circulation not getting to that artic articular surface. Rutin also is uh, the best thing if you ever are exposed to ionizing radiation. If we ever have a fallout, you want to be taking lots of rutin. And they, they, they did a lot of studies on rutin back in the 50s when they were doing nuclear testing. And rutin was the number one thing that they found to be protective. What is rutin, by the way? Uh, it's, it's just a, it's a bioflavonoid. It's part of the vitamin C complex. Uh, you, you find the, the, the highest place for it is in buckwheat but it's in other things. And you can Google 
sources of root and, and, and it'll it'll give you other other sources but the very best source is, is buckwheat I see. Uh, Saruta Plus also has uh, quercetin in it which is another bioflavonoid and they've shown in studies that that will lower your CRP and so one of the things I do when people have high CRP is I also put them on Saruta Plus. What doses do you like to use? Pardon? What doses do you like to use? I do, uh, I usually do eight a day, four in the morning, four at night, unless somebody has vascular disease uh, and we're trying, to, we're trying to solve something like varicose veins or slow that process down, then I'll go up to 12 a day. And then uh, the heart sound recorder basically um, is a device um, originally uh, invented by Royal Lee back in the, um, 40s, I guess, and this is a modern version of it. It was called the endocardiograph. And so what it does is, is it has a microphone or accelerometer <coughs> that you place on the valves of your heart and, and it, it'll display a graph of what is going on with, with your heart. And it's a very good way of figuring out if you have nutritional issues. Uh, a classic example of that, we talked about calcium. Okay. If, if you've got calcium tissue starvation, which is typically a K2 problem or cataplex F problem, <coughs> you'll miss that second sound in your in your heart. So, uh, and so we use the, we use this quite a bit, not only to evaluate uh, if people have a heart issue, but it's also a very good way to evaluate if people have uh, <coughs> nutritional issues, particularly B vitamins. I mean, somebody I think somebody mentioned B vitamins. B4 particularly is the the one that's missing with uh, with a lot of people because you can't synthetically make B4. You have to get that in your uh, diet, or you have to get it from Catholic B. And uh, B4 is the main um, vitamin that causes electricity to go to your heart to to make your heart beat good and strong. So, so if anybody wants to have theirs tested, we can we can do that afterwards. What are what are natural sources of B4? Um, apples, I, I'm trying to remember the list. They're, I mean, they're, they're small amounts and certain, mostly fresh vegetables. I think apples is one of the higher ones. Yeah. I have the list, but not on me, so anyway. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so when you said the iodine, people who react to it, it's because they're deficient. What kind of reaction are you talking about? Like you, usually they will get headaches, uh, sore throats, uh, kind of a flu and cold-like symptom. The reason being is there, there's, the there's, there's three, three halogen molecules, or four. So there's, there's chlorine, bromine, and iodine, and may, I guess that's, I guess there's just three. Is there one more? Fluoride. In there? Fluoride. Yeah, fluoride. So there's four. Uh -huh. And so the, the the other three halogens are toxic. But when you're low on iodine, your body will tend to hold on to those to to mimic iodine because it's a clo it's a close, close close in chemical structure. And so when you start taking iodine, the body will start dumping those and make people sick. Dumping those. To, what about itching? Itching? Yeah. Yeah, that's always a possibility. Like if somebody really itches to beta dying. Yeah, that's that's a. If somebody swims a lot, do they absorb that chlorine and it replaces? Yeah, yeah I've seen a lot of people that that um, have a lot of problem with chlorine, and one of the ways we deal with that, you know, like high school swimmers and whatnot, is we get them on iodine, so they don't absorb so much chlorine. But they still will absorb it, but it helps to keep them from getting sick. So. Any other questions? You know, the reason I asked you about um, root, 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 just a comment I want to make. My grandma was born in 1902, and I can remember growing up, every time she took her vitamins, she had very nice skin and very nice legs, <laughs> uh -huh. which she was not afraid to brag about. <laughs> and, but I remember at least 20 times she said, I take rutin so I don't get varicose veins. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I was wondering what is rutin because it did work on her. Well, yeah, and and way back in the in the early 1900s, there were there were there would be mag I have a collection of this. And one of the reasons I know so much about rutin is I went to a symposium over in uh, Colorado for standard process and and Mark Anderson spent like a whole day on 
on showing all the old research on rutin and all the old magazine articles <laughs> on rutin and, and, and all and you know what it would do to prevent varicose veins and, and different things like that. So the research is out there. A lot of that has just been lost, you know. Interesting. Because we're focusing on the wrong stuff now. Mm -hmm. so.